Thank you all for, for being here. The chairman outlined what's already been reduced from the defense budget this year. Most members of Congress, most Americans don't, don't realize that. But, but you all have said uh, that, that you can handle that much, uh, that, that uh, it's okay. Uh, most of us, I think, agree that another $600 billion uh, in sequestration is not okay. That is unacceptable. But I think the greater danger is that uh, some of our colleagues will say, well, if, if, if 465 is okay, why not 466 or another 50 or another $100 billion out of defense. And after all, it's not the $600 billion, but it's just a little bit more. And, uh, and if 465 is okay, why isn't that okay? And I would appreciate y'all's answer to, to that argument, because I think that is the greater likelihood of what we face. First, uh, Congressman, I would say 465 is not okay. It's something that we can manage, uh, but it comes at risk. It does not come without risk. Uh, in the Army's case, we're, we've been asked to reduce to 520, but that's even before the $465 billion cut. And so we're going to have to significantly reduce the Army smaller to meet the $465 uh, billion cut. If it goes further, we won't, we, we, we'll have to decrease the size of the Army even more, and we will now have to start significantly decreasing the National Guard and the Reserve component along with it. So it will have dynamic and dramatic impacts on our ability to respond, whether it be not only abroad, but in support of civil authorities, in support of nat national disasters and other things. So th this, once you get behind 65 billion, we've taken all the efficiencies we can take. We have taken out structure. We've reduced modernization. In my mind, in some cases, lower than we really need it to reduce modernization already. If we go beyond that, we now, it becomes critical. And it becomes the fact that we will no longer modernize. We will no longer be able to respond to a variety of threats. We'll have to get to a size that is small enough where I believe, as I said earlier, we might lose our credibility in terms of our ability to deter. And, 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 and that's the difference. So it's not okay at $465 billion. It's something we've been able to work ourselves through with risk, but anything beyond that becomes even higher risk. Thank you, sir. Sheriff, sure, uh, little chartlet that I, that I gave you, if you look at the number of ships, that's today. So we go to the, as we've kind of said, okay, and I agree with General Odierno, it, it's not necessarily okay. With a new strategic approach that says this is what I want your Navy to do, my Navy to do in the future, then perhaps it's manageable. But that's less ships than you see on this little chartlet. You go beyond that, we're probably talking about reducing force structure for the reasons my colleagues described. We have to be a whole force able to meet what you ask us to do today. We have to have our sailors organized, trained, and equipped to do that job and motivated. The industrial base is fragile, as we've described before. So what area of the world do we not want to be in and, and where must we be? And we've described Asia Pacific and the Arabian Gulf is there. And the risk to not be in those other areas uh, or if there, very episodically, is the risk we got to understand, in my view, to go forward. Thank you. Sir, I'd give you one example. Um, weapon system support is vitally important to maintaining the readiness of our platforms. It's spares, it's depot, it's flight line activity. And we are below 80% on, on the required funding for weapon system support. That is a, an example of the risk we are taking. Incremental cuts that you talked about above that level will come out of accounts like we weapon system support. We have got to have an Air Force and Armed Forces that our youngsters who are the most battle-hardened ever want, are proud to be a part of. And being good is a vital part of that. I see further incremental cuts, just marginal, as you suggested, as affecting those accounts that are not major programs, but rather would, would reduce our readiness and therefore would be unacceptable. Congressman, another uh, example uh, might be helpful. When 
We designed, the, uh, as a result of Secretary Gates' direction last fall, when we designed the Marine Corps to come down from 202,000 down to some number, he told the Marine Corps, I want you to take risk in the high-end missions. That means major contingency operations, major combat. Uh, and so we did. We built a Marine Corps uh, using the, ten le or the, uh, the lessons of 10 years of war, incorporated that in there, and came up with a Marine Corps of 24 infantry battalions, about 186,800 Marines. That, is a, that was a one major contingency operation force. And what that means is, if, if without, without naming an operational plan, if we go to war, the Marines are going to go and they're going to come home when it's over. There'll be no rotation of forces. There'll be no, there'll be no dwell. There's no, there'll be no such thing as dwell. It will just go on and come home when it's over. So when we went to 465 and dropped another 5,000 Marines, effectively, we're still so working through that right now, we dropped the numbers of battalions below that. So we are at risk right now for being able to take your Marine Corps and deploy it to a major contingency operation and do what our nation expects us to do. So you go beyond that, a billion, two billion, five billion, it's going to come down in force structure and it will be capabilities and ability to respond.